Recognize that the way the study is conducted that generates the data has a large impact on how you're able to analyze that data. Ideally, when we wanted to test the effect of an intervention on an outcome, we would conduct a randomized control study where one group of individuals is randomized to the intervention, another group is uh, randomized to the comparison group, which might be a placebo, and we're able to compare the outcome for the two groups. If you're analyzing data that was generated in a randomized control trial, you might be able to not stratify and not worry about confounding because this study design itself is designed to eliminate observed and unobserved confounding. On the other hand, if the data you're analyzing came from an observational study, whether that's a cross-sectional study where you look at a single point in time and you conduct maybe a one-time survey, a cohort study where you enroll patients and follow them over time, and recognize that a cohort can be prospective if you do it that way, or it can be retrospective if you try to mimic a prospective design using data that's already been collected. Or whether you look at a case control study where you have a group of people who experienced the outcome and a group of people who didn't experience the outcome and you're trying to compare exposures. The way you account for the experimental group, which was the randomized control study, is different from the, uh, the observational group. In the experimental group, you did not have to worry about confounding. In the observational group, you have to worry about confounding. And typically that's dealt with either through stratification on the confounder, like was done by Bradford Hill in that last slide, where he looked at different age groups uh, and men and women separately, or you can do an adjusted analysis using regression, which we won't cover in this class. There are multiple biases that can show up in observational studies that can impact your ability to reach a conclusion about your question that you were trying to answer. One of those is selection bias. So the selection uh, of who goes into that observational data set is not random. For example, if you are uh, dealing with people who come to Michigan Medicine for their outpatient care, you can't make conclusions about the general population because you're only dealing with those individuals who've made a decision to seek care or are able to seek care. Second, there's information bias. There may be wrong or inexact recording of individual factors. Either risk factors or the outcome being studied might be recorded incorrectly. There's recall bias, where people may not remember things from the past. So you might ask someone, how much coffee did you drink you know, 10 years ago? And even if they answered one to two cups a day, that number may not actually be accurate because they may not actually truly remember that. There's interviewer bias. If the data is collected through an interviewer, the interviewer's biases might lead to leading questions being asked that lead to particular answers uh, that don't actually reflect what the recipient, you know, the person answering the survey's thoughts were on that question. Data could be systematically missing. Um, and so if we're looking at the relationship between a lab result and, and a health outcome, the lab only gets ordered when a physician is worried that that person might have a health outcome. And so when you look at those kinds of relationships, you might reach faulty conclusions about whether a particular lab result actually is a risk factor for a particular outcome. There are measurement errors where things might be miscalibrated. Um, and that's not unique to observational studies, but it's unique to kind of all studies. And finally, there's other sources of biases. We already have discussed confounding. We discussed Simpson's paradox. And there are other ones like lead time bias and ecological fallacy that you can look up um, to see if they apply to your data.